The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Canada's Conservative Party dumped their leader this week. Tonight, why and where does the party go from here? Then our Ontario hubs reflect on the significance of Black History Month. And from Canada's falling birth rate to understanding what's called long COVID, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, February 4th, and that's ahead on the Agenda. Erwin O'Toole lost a confidence vote taken by the Federal Conservative Caucus on Wednesday that brought an end to his 17-month tenure as leader of the party. He's not the first one who didn't last long. Why is that? With us now for their thoughts from the nation's capital, Ben Woodfinden, who writes the Dominion newsletter on Substack and is a doctoral student in political theory at McGill University. And in Mississauga, Ontario, Tasha Kerridan, national political columnist for Post Media and a principal at the strategy and public affairs firm, Navigator. Welcome to you both. Hello. I can only imagine how tired you both are. We were talking about it a little <laughs> bit. Um, but you know, for the audience who doesn't really pay a lot of attention to politics outside of, say, an election, um, they might look and say, every time I look, uh, the Canadian Conservatives has a new leader. Why is that? What would you say? Uh, Tasha, I'll start with you. Well, it's been the last three election cycles that we've seen this happen. Um, and I think uh, there's a frustration when the Conservatives lose. I think in the last few, um, part of the frustration has been a sense that they haven't had the right direction. And the leader has made mistakes, and they've basically made the leader pay for that. I think it's a combination of things, though. I think that also this time around, the caucus didn't feel that it was being respected by its leader. They had some frustrations with how he was running things. So. I think that it's, it's it's really a bit of a, a combination of those things. I mean, the, the Conservative Party doesn't hasn't always had an eat the leader mentality, but it certainly has one now. And Ben, Tasha mentioned that you know the caucus didn't feel uh, respected by Mr. O'Toole. Uh, he campaigned to the right to win the party nomination, and then to the center in the general election. Um, and some people felt uh, that alienated their uh, their views. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to people who do pay attention only at election and say the Conservatives have yet another leader that I have to uh, learn more about? Yeah, I think you make a good point that uh, lots of this was to do with kind of how caucus felt, obviously, about about uh, O'Toole. Um, O'Toole won his leadership uh, campaigning as, you know, as, as he self-described, true blue Tory. Um, and then he pivoted uh, fairly quickly after winning the leadership. Uh, and I think he was probably making a, a, a safe gamble there that um, he wasn't going to be able to win uh, a general election uh, campaigning the exact same way he won the conservative leadership. Um, so that so that made sense. Um, but the the way the pivot was done, I think um, it was poorly executed at times. It'd be a mild way of putting it. Um, I suspect he probably knew that the, the gamble that he was making in doing this um, made this outcome likely. Um, had had they won the election, had they formed government, I think it's quite possible that these things would have been kind of papered over. Right, winning solves lots of problems. Um, but the gamble didn't pay off. Of course, they didn't win. Um, and it was probably only a matter of time, I suspect, in hindsight, that, uh, that something like this was going to happen. You know, uh, this is all happening on the backdrop of a pandemic, right? Um, I think there's been so much happening in everyone's lives these past few years. Um, but, Tasha, I, I want to go back to what Ben was saying. You know, um, some people have called Mr. O'Toole a hypocrite, and some people have said he was trying to be everything to everybody. But isn't this a uh, common political tactic? Well, uh, I don't know if it's a common political tactic. Brokerage politics or, you know, trying to please different constituencies is something that you do often when you're in government. Um, you know, you have to you have to balance interests. The challenge here is balancing interests within his own party. I think it was a lack of authenticity that was the problem because it's one thing to, you know, find compromises. And I think you know, previous conservative leaders, I think of Stephen Harper, for example, on the issue of abortion, found a compromise with the social conservative wing of his party uh, in that he said abortions off the table as a policy don't go there but we're going to do other things um, in the realm of uh, social conservatism such as establishing an office for the protection of religious freedoms abroad um, so there were things he did to please his constituency without you know doing things that he thought would be politically inexpedient 
Um, but here you have a situation where Mr. O'Toole did a, a 180. Um, you know, like Ben said, it, he went from being the true blue to all of a sudden he was a, a, a red Tory or a progressive conservative mold. And so people said, well, you know, that's not authentic. Who are you? And I think that was part of the frustration um, more than simply switching positions. And Ben, Tasha spoke of uh, Mr. O'Toole's authenticity problem, um, but she also spoke of compromising. Can you win the general election in Canada without um, the center? Um, I think it depends how you define it. Um, it's I think it's, it's undeniable that conservatives are going to have to be present some sort of kind of moderate image of themselves to the to the general population, to the voting population, to win. Um, where I think maybe there's uh, there's room for conservatives to kind of uh, still be conservative um, is it's up. It's in some sense it's up to them to kind of p decide for themselves what that means, right? Um, I think there was at times it said, at times it seemed like with with O'Toole and his team that they were um, they were almost embarrassed to be conservative. They were almost sometimes apologizing for it. Um, That's interesting, Ben. So Sorry, embarrassed. Why? Uh, well, you know, he said things. I recall um, uh, during towards the end of the election, he said something. Uh, O'Toole said something like, um, "This is not your father's conservative party." Um, no, it wasn't. You know, I think at that night actually he was there uh, with Brian Mulroney, uh, which is an interesting thing to say. Well, well, you know, your father's <laughs> your father's Conservative Party leader was right there. Um, but I, yeah, I don't think um, I think they can present something moderate and serious without necessarily having to become uh, indistinguishable from the Liberals. Uh, what the what the Conservatives are going to have to learn how to do is figure out how to win and how to win while still being conservative. Right? They're a Conservative Party for a reason. They've got to figure out how to thread that needle. Um, you, uh, you mentioned something about, you know, appealing to the center. Um, and I have to wonder, you know, uh, Mr. Trudeau won two elections after the pictures of him came out with him wearing the blackface. Um, by not appealing to the center, are conservatives making it harder for themselves to be elected or are they making it easier for the liberals to win? Tasha? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's it's not even so much appealing to the center per se, but saying what they are and overlapping a segment of voters who would, who would be prepared to vote conservative if they felt comfortable with that political club. And I'm thinking here of blue liberals, um, people who are sort of in the in the middle but share certain principles, including fiscal conservatism. Uh, with the Conservative Party, what they react against a lot, uh, we see, um, especially in the suburbs, and you know, I'm here in, in Mississauga today, and this, this, these types of ridings, is this perception the Conservative Party is intolerant, um, even racist? It goes back to the 2015, uh, you know, barbaric practices tip line that was in their campaign there, that really was a big strike against them because it it, it raised that specter of you know, of hidden agenda or racism that the conservatives, unfortunately, are often tagged with, and unfairly so. But when they do things like that, you know, it's harder to shake off. So I think, going back to your, your original question, um, it's a question of defining themselves, kind of like what Ben said. I mean, who are they? What do they stand for? And conservatives do stand for principles that appeal, I think, to a wide swath of Canadians, including, um, you know, incremental change, community, a balance of community and the individual. It's not only about the individual. It is about freedom, but also responsibility. These kinds of things that in the pandemic, I think we've we've kind of lost a lot of that conversation. It's gone really one way. And I think the conservatives need to recapture that. It's the, the tradition of Canadian conservatism. Um, Tasha, you mentioned the barbaric uh, practices hotline, and I wanted to just kind of uh, stay on that for a second. And this question is to you, Ben. You know, I come from uh, East Africa, from a country called Uganda, and Uganda is a very uh, conservative country. There's very little government intervention. Um, just Google, it's very socially conservative. Just Google Uganda's gay bill. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people that come from Caribbean countries that are very uh, conservative. But when you look at the Canadian conservative party, it's pretty homogenous, with the exception of Dr. Leslie Lewis. Um, and, you know, James Cummings' report found that uh, Aaron O'Toole didn't do enough to reach into various immigrant and ethnic communities in Canada. Um, is that something that the Conservative Party has to address moving forward? Yeah, I, I, I think it's pretty. Um, they're never going to win uh, without being able to do something like this, obviously. Um, and, they, and also, you know, for, for principal reasons, they should. Um, uh, like, like you say, a lot of these uh, immigrant, uh, ethnic, um, and these diverse communities, um, a lot of their values in many ways are very small-c conservative values, right? These are people the Conservative Party should be able to reach. 
Um, so the question of why they don't reach these people is something that uh, something that they need to seriously ask and do some uh, do some serious soul searching on. Um, I think it's probably um, you know. Uh, Communities are not homogenous, right? It's not. It's not. Uh, communities have different uh, different interests and uh, different ways of seeing things. So it's not like you can treat um, all these communities the same. Um, but yeah, lots. Like you say, lots of these communities hold like socially conservative, small c conservative values, and uh, tapping into that from, to the conservatives isn't just kind of something that they should kind of be, uh, you know, like reluctantly doing. Um, it's something. It's a, it's a treasure trove for them to unlock, right? If they could figure out how to do that, right? If they could have to figure out how to tap into conservative, uh, conservative communities, that might be their path to you know becoming a kind of the governing party as opposed to the opposition party. Uh, Tasha, I saw you nodding your head. Hmm. Yes, it's something that the Conservative Party has tried to do in the past. Um, and uh, under Stephen Harper, Jason Kenney was uh, the Minister of Immigration. He courted. Um, new Canadian communities very avidly. Um, he was known for that. And those efforts were then, like I said, really torpedoed in 2015 when the party, um, the controversy of the kneecap and the citizenship oath and all that stuff came out. And um, and the party was seen as having a perspective that many Canadians were, you know, they were they reacted strongly against. Now, that's not to say that some people didn't agree with the kneecap issue, but when they pushed it further with the tip line, that's where they lost a lot of people's uh, votes. And this is something the Conservatives have to wrestle with. I think it's also exacerbated by the populist wave that has swept the entire globe, frankly, and is really here now. I think the, the protests we've seen in Ottawa have really brought home the fact that this is not going to be a struggle in the next leadership between the traditional factions of the Conservative Party, you know, SOCONs and fiscal Conservatives and Libertarians. There's a new animal on the scene, and it's populism, and it's American-style populism, and it is something that is not part of our tradition. Um, it is very, um, I would say, almost aggressive in the way that it approaches its anti-government stance. Conservatives are small government, but they're not no government. And I think that um, you know, the many Canadians will be turned off by what they've seen in the protest because they don't feel comfortable going to where that is. So the Conservatives have to be very careful, I think, as they go forward and have a real honest conversation about what they are. And I do think that unless they move to a more progressive conservative position, they will not form government, as Ben said. Um, I want to come back to that in a moment. We're going to talk about the Ottawa, uh, what's going on in Ottawa. Um, you know, I mentioned that this has all been happening within a pandemic, 17 months. Uh, ben, was O'Toole, Mr. Was Mr. O'Toole given enough time by his party to become the leader that they needed him to be? Um, well, I think uh, regardless of what you think of, of, uh, of O'Toole, you should, there is... Um, there's reason to have some sympathy for him, right? Um, he was he was elected leader uh, in a leadership election that got postponed during the pandemic. Uh, so he was he was chosen as the leader in I believe August 2020, um, and then basically a year later he's fighting a general election. Um, I don't think he actually met his entire caucus in person until after the most recent election, right? Um, that that is a being opposition leader is tough to begin with. It's a thankless job, um, but he had an even tougher time of it than most, I think. And so in th in that sense. Um, yeah, I think he he personally is probably right to feel aggrieved about um, kind of the short the short leash he was given. Um, uh, whether or not it's a good idea that this rule that the the party has kind of informally established for itself now that it's kind of one and done, right? You form government or we we select a new leader. Um, that's probably not a good idea for the party to kind of think that way. Um, uh, but you know this this has happened for O'Toole now, and like, like I said uh, earlier, the gamble he took in the election was if he pivoted and he won. Um, he'd, st he'd still be leader right now, almost certainly. Uh, the pivot didn't work, and he lost. And so now he's now he's you know now he's up to the job. Um, you said it's not a good idea for the party itself, but do you think? What do you think Canadians who would who might vote for the Conservatives are thinking by watching all this stuff go down, Ben? Um, I'd be to be honest with you, I'd be shocked if most Canadians were paying too much attention to this. Um, you know, lots of us kind of tune out between elections. So, so I don't think the Conservatives are kind of, you know, they've, 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 they've destroyed themselves by doing this in, on that front. Um, I think maybe, uh, some again, something O'Toole could probably feel aggrieved by is that um, even by the end of the election, I'm not sure that many Canadians actually knew who he was or knew much about him. Um, the next leader, whoever that is, is going to have to work on that, right? Um, we don't know who the, uh, if it's Trudeau or someone else that he's facing off against, he or she is facing off against. Um, Trudeau has obviously kind of got the kind of name recognition of the brand that uh, no, no other politician in this country can compete with. Um, whoever the next leader is, is going to have to figure out how to, not only how to kind of make sure Canadians uh, know who they are, 
but they've got to define who they are for themselves, right? Don't let your opponent uh, paint you as what they want you to be. Uh, get out there early and define who you are uh, on your own terms, not on your opponent's terms. And Tasha, you mentioned uh, Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper before. Um, what do you think it was about him that made him able to unify the various factions of the Conservative Party that no leader has been able to do since? I think a few things. Um, he was a very strong personality. Um, he was very decisive and he was authentic. I think that that's one thing that, you know, that was one of the issues here. Uh, with Stephen Harper, you knew what you got. He'd been in public life. He'd been in the Reform Party as an MP, and then he was uh, in the National Citizens Coalition as their president for quite a while. So people knew what they were getting with him. There was no surprise. And he, you know, I think he also, just like I said, had, had a force of personality that was able to manage people and convince them that, uh, you know, under him, first of all, they, they won, they could win. But secondly, that um, he would respect uh, what they had to say and, and um, or at least hear them out. Uh, so I think that, the, unfortunately, he didn't leave much of a legacy. This was the issue. I mean, he was he was there for three terms, but there was no obvious successor. And as a result, um, you ended up with a lot of infighting. It's still in many ways, you know, is Stephen Harper's party, but Stephen Harper's no longer there. So how will it define itself going forward? Um, it needs that big tent because he did have a big tent. It wasn't quite as big as Mr. Mulroney's. It didn't include Quebec to the same extent. But that has been the winning formula for conservatives uh, every time they formed a majority government. Um, Tasha mentioned uh, the convoy in Ottawa. Ben, you're in Ottawa right now. Um, what, in your view, what role did the trucker convoy play in Mr. O'Toole's unseating? Um, it, it, it undoubtedly played a role. Uh, I, I won't claim to be privy to kind of, you know, internal caucus discussions. Um, but, you know, you could see um, Mr. O'Toole uh, in the, uh, I believe it was last week, uh, as the convoy was approaching Ottawa, um, he gave, I think he had, you know, a couple different positions, right? He kept changing. Um, and so that's part, this is part of the kind of the authenticity problem that, uh, that Tasha's talking about here. Um, but I don't necessarily, again, I don't necessarily think that's entirely on uh, O'Toole himself. Um, part of the reason he kept kind of, you know, uh, changing his position was because his caucus was essentially forcing him to, right? You had MPs going out there and like actively, um, actively meeting with and taking pictures with these protesters and, um, Were they undermining him? Right? Sorry, not to interrupt. Were they undermining him? Uh, I don't know if they were, you know, if that was deliberate or not. Um, I can't, I, I suspect it probably did undermine him. Um, you know, all the reports that have come out about these kind of final uh, caucus meetings is that they were uh, bloodbaths is the term that's been used, uh, thrown around a couple of times. Um, so I think, yeah, regardless of, you know, what, pe what people in the party think about uh, the convoy itself, um, the, the, the divisions over it, the divides over this are undoubtedly, you know, the, there are there are bigger fissures in the party and this is kind of just one little uh, little kind of uh, snippet of where these fissures really are starting to emerge. And Tasha, I think in one of your columns, you described Mr. O'Toole uh, as a dead man walking. Um, it's being said that the truckers protesters came to Ottawa to topple the Liberal government, but they ended up actually toppling the leader of the opposition. Do you think that they see it that way? Uh, it's interesting that you raise that because, in fact, on Sunday at the press conference that the uh, leaders of the protest had, they said that Mr. O'Toole should step aside and that someone like Pierre Polyev or Leslin Lewis would be an appropriate choice to lead the Conservative Party. And then they made it clear they weren't partisan. But at the end of the day, you do have to wonder. Uh, There's a very interesting uh, interview that uh, journalist Matt Gurney did with an insider in the Conservative caucus uh, who said that as Ben said, the caucus meetings have been bloodbaths all January, and that this was kind of a tipping point, that the convoy um, didn't necessarily come in with that agenda, but it certainly focused everything on the leadership or the lack thereof, the response that O'Toole had to the convoy, which wasn't satisfactory, and I think that was a bit of a nail in the coffin. And certainly other people, um, and the two individuals I mentioned, were very active on social media and meeting people. Um, and so it, it, you do have to wonder. Um, we're in a leadership now, and uh, they, they are probably going to be two, two of the contenders everyone's talking about anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, it's events, dear boy, the famous, famous citation. Uh, things can change on the, you know, the drop of a hat, and now they have. Um, you know, um, Ben, Tasha mentioned, you know, we've been talking about some of the members who've from the Conservative Party who've met uh, with some of the uh, people at this convoy and taken pictures, um, including interim leader Candace Bergen. Um, what do you think that signals as far as the direction that the party is going? 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I, to be honest, I don't. I don't think we know yet. Um, I think a lot of this is going to depend how this uh, what, how this convoy uh, plays out and how it ends. Um, and and I, I'm not going to speculate on exactly what uh, how that might happen. Um, there is undoubtedly, as, as Tasha said, there's undoubtedly a kind of um, a populist moment right now uh, within the within the base and within the the membership more broadly. Um, and if we have a leadership election in the in the very near future, which we almost certainly will. Um, you know, th this is going to play a role in that in that race. Um, how exactly that plays out, um, I think, is probably quite unpredictable. Um, and the leader, the person who wins, may well be the one that can channel that. Um, I don't think the conservatives should necessarily run away from uh, all of the kind of stuff that we associate with this kind of populist shift. Um, so some of the shifts that we've seen in places like uh, the United Kingdom in the last few years. Uh, where we see a kind of shift towards more, uh, what's called like blue collar, uh, working class people uh, shifting to the right, this kind of realignment. Um, I think there's there's potential for success there for conservatives here. Um, these shifts are taking place here too, even if they're a bit more um, a bit more kind of uh, complicated by regional differences. Um, and I think the uh, what what I would hope a responsible conservative leader will do um, is figure out how to kind of maybe tap into that. Uh, but also kind of um, uh, keep a lid on the, the darker sides of this, the more dangerous sides of it, right? Um, I, I think in a, in a column during the election, there was a, in, uh, I think it was, I think it was John Ibbotson um, referred to it as kind of uh, responsible populism or serious populism. Um, if such a thing is possible, I think that's probably what um, I would hope the next leader at least tries to uh, tries to do to kind of take advantage of this movement or, or you know, recognize the reality of this movement uh, without letting it kind of um, hijack the party and the movement itself. Um, it's been hard to see, you know, uh, and I want to say this carefully because I know that there's a lot of people that are part of this at the truckers uh, convoy who aren't bigots, who are um, upset with the mandates. They might have lost their jobs. I have two kids and trying to navigate two years at home has been really, really challenging. Um, so there's a lot of people who are uh, upset with the mandates, who are upset about uh, the lockdowns, but they're not part of this convoy. And if you're watching this um, and you're seeing all of this happening and uh, the interim leader meeting with people who are holding up uh, flags with hate, uh, with swastikas, Confederate flags, um, you know, you might wonder, where does a pr pragmatic centrist conservative go? Uh, Tasha? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that that was something that was a missed opportunity at this protest, to call that out on the spot. I've said it before, I thought that Mr. O'Toole shouldn't have been absent. I thought he should have addressed that crowd and said, you know, to your point, um, that there are a lot of good people here who are legitimately frustrated, upset. They just don't know what to do with themselves. They just want to make their voice heard. But, you know, you over there with the Confederate flag, you're not welcome. Like, get out, go away. That's not, that's not what this is. Uh, but no one did that. And, you know, protesters were walking with other protesters who had those hateful things. And I don't think anyone, at least I certainly didn't see anyone reported or confronting them saying, you know, take that away. So that's the problem. It's, it's like guilt by association. I 100% I agree with you. It's not the, the overwhelming number of people. And most of the people have left. What's left in Ottawa, and, you know, Ben probably knows it more than, than, than we do because he's on ground zero, um, are people who have dug in really for a hardcore, you know, we're going to stay here. They've raised all this money. It is, it is taking on a very uh, disturbing turn. I think the conservatives have to be very careful about this because they are also the party of law and order. That is part of the conservative tradition. Yep. Freedom, free speech, free expression, absolutely. But this is not what that is. The expression's been had. And if you cast your mind back two years ago to the protests uh, the Wet'suwet'en had, um, which were you know across the country, frankly, at different rail uh, points and things like that, they had a very different tone about that. So you got to wonder here um, if they're seen as agreeing too much with what's going on and it takes a very dark turn, as Ben said, or I think you just said, they will pay for that association. So they really I think they really have to be careful trying to you know, pin this all on the lap of the prime minister or say, oh, yeah, you deal with it now. No, 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 no. All politicians have to be responsible here. And Ben? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree with that. Um, you know, I, we all, I think we all hope this kind of this, this dissipates by itself and it does so in a peaceful way. Uh, but the longer this goes on, um, you know, the, the more, I think it was, uh, I think we've referenced Matt Gurney already. I think it was Gurney who mentioned uh, last week that, you know, the longer this goes on, it's the hardcore people that will get left. Um, there's a lot of genuinely very angry and very frustrated people out there right now. Um, and it's understandable, right? I think everyone is frustrated right now. Um, and so these, 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 this convoy appears to have tapped into that kind of, that kind of anger. Um, 
But again, the conservatives themselves have to be very careful uh, with what you know. I think they can uh, there can be legitimate grievances that they um, that they share that they sympathise with. They've got to be they've got to be clear. You know, they've got to be extremely firm and clear. And you know, these are the things that we think are concerns, and these are the things that we are you know we think are legitimate grievances. These are the things that we think are unacceptable and we condemn. Right. So much of this problem is stems from just kind of confused mixed messaging. Right. Be clear and be assertive. Tell people what you support. Tell people what you think. And tell people most importantly, you know, what you don't support and what you don't think. Uh, ben and Tasha, thank you so much for your time. I know we're going to come back to this uh, over the next little while. Um, before we go, though, Tasha, I understand you're writing a book about the future of the Conservative Party. So the timing for you, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure you're not going to sleep for a long time. Can you give us 30 seconds of what you're working on? Sure. Uh, the working title is The Right Path, How Conservatives Can Unite, Inspire, and Take Canada Forward. And uh, I started working on this well before this happened. Uh, in fact, just after the election, um, I was inspired to, to start thinking about this project. And um, this is exactly what I'd like to do, is advance some ideas that could help uh, whoever leads the party and wherever the party goes next to really do those things and to be a force for good, a positive force for change, and hopefully a, you know, a government in, uh, in waiting hold the Liberals to account. So there we go. Well, Tasha and Ben, thank you so much. And I know we'll, we'll have you back, Tasha, when the book comes out. Um, take thank good you. care. Thanks. Black History Month began this week. And though the name might suggest it's mostly about looking back at past events, it's also very much about looking forward. Ashley Quosa is TVO's diversity and inclusion reporter, and she joins us now from the provincial capital to explain. Hello, Ashley. Hi, Jan. All right, so Black History Month began in Canada in 1995. How did it exactly come about? Um, so I was actually able to speak to Dr. Jean Augustine, who in 1995, as a member of parliament, uh, brought forth the vote to officially designate February as Black History Month in Canada. And the vote passed unanimously. Um, and Dr. Augustine pointed out that at the time, social justice issues or issues that really affected Black Canadians weren't I guess you would say front and center in parliament. But for her, what she wanted to do with recognizing February as Black History Month was really about, um, you know, making sure that the truth and the experiences of Black people in Canada were recognized and to make sure that in schools, the history of Black people in Canada, the migration of Black people in Canada, the contributions of Black people in Canada, and the diversity of Black people in Canada were really recognized. So now let's fast forward. Uh, it's fairly ingrained in, in Canadian culture that February is Black History Month. How can we guard against it becoming uh, a thing to do rather than a meaningful commemoration or a call to action for change? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, the conversations about the realities of Black people today is really incredibly important. And you you kind of alluded to that in the beginning. The month is called Black History Month, and we're encouraged and called to look back. But it would be a disservice to look back without really acknowledging that Black people are still advocating for certain things today and really acknowledging how racism still affects Black people today. So I think that by looking at the past, um, you know, we shouldn't almost delude ourselves into thinking that we're in a post-racial society. I think we still need to acknowledge that there's a lot of work to be done. And let's talk about that work. You know, there are a number of organizations uh, that during this month, you know, put together, you know, um, sort of statements and, and such like that. But I want to talk from a media standpoint, because we are mm -hmm. reporters. Um, how can media organizations who are marking this month help advance progress towards uh, eliminating anti-black racism, but also uh, talking about a little bit what you said about making sure that we talk about not just the history, but moving that forward? Yeah, I think that work done by media organizations to commemorate this month should be done all year round, right? And that includes hiring black journalists at every level. You know, one black reporter, two black reporters in a newsroom isn't really enough. You know, I would say that to truly reflect the diversity of black experience in a place like Canada or like Ontario, um, newsrooms really should try to look like the communities that they're covering. Um, you know, and when 
media organizations do hire black journalists, they should listen to them and support them. And, you know, when it comes to the stories that these media organizations are telling about black people, you know, I think that we, and, you know, I say we, all of us journalists included, shouldn't really rely on narratives and stereotypes about, you know, black people. We should be you know, thinking outside the box, there should we should be telling stories about Black joy and Black innovation. I think there's so much focus on the struggle. You know, this month is not just about the struggle. Black people, the experience of Black people is not just about the struggle. So let's talk about uh, progress. Obviously, from 1995 to now, what progress has come out of Black History Month, um, do you think? You know, that's a, a big question. And, and I think it's only been four days this year. So I don't I don't know, um, you know, about this year. And I don't think anyone knows yet. But I will say that in the last two or so years with the pandemic, with the unfortunate high profile deaths of black people, both in the US and Canada, I would like to think that more people would be willing and and open to having more conversations about lasting change and not just performative commemorations, but real change. All right, so let's talk about some of the, the articles that you have coming out this month. Um, you are writing one about a charter that I don't think a lot of people know about. It's called the Scarborough Charter. Tell us about that and how it sort of came to be. Yeah, so the Scarborough Charter is being described as the first national action plan to tackle anti-Black racism in higher education. About 50, or more so 51, post-secondary institutions in Canada have signed on to this charter. 25 of them, I believe, are in Ontario. And the charter has four principles that aim to address anti-Black racism on campus. So, for example, one of these principles looks like um, inclusive excellence, or it's called inclusive excellence. And according to the charter, this can be done by recruiting and supporting um, Black staff, you know, creating Black and Black um, Canadian studies programs in classrooms and really developing pathways for access to higher education for Black students in the community. Now, sometimes, you know, some people will say uh, when post-secondary institutions release statements on anti-Black racism, it can feel performative. Um, when we talk about post-secondary institutions and we talk about sort of the, the Scarborough Charter, what are, what are actual things happening? Are there tangible things? Yeah, so I would say that in the last year or so, a number of post-secondary institutions in Ontario have put forth action plans, have put together task forces. The University of Windsor, for example, has put together an anti-Black racism task force that at the end of last year, I believe, brought forth recommendations that included um, creating spaces for Black students, collecting demogra demographic data, things like that. And also, one thing to point about the University of Windsor example is that these task forces also made up of students, of Black students. So I think making sure that Black students are having their voices and concern, concerns heard are one thing that universities are doing. Some institutions are also making sure to create offices, real higher, um, I guess, higher up office positions or administrative positions with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion so that people in those positions can actually affect change. I also understand you're working on some, on, on some articles, some Q&As, but also an article about uh, female black voices sort of in political circles. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, um, thanks for asking. I think it's the story is really about the experience of black women in politics in Ontario. I've spoken to a number of women who run for office at different levels in the process and the province, and we're really talking about what their experience has been, you know, during the election process when they did get into office, and you know, also talking to experts about what you know what's the importance of having black women and and their voices in polit in these political spaces, and what can we do to increase participation, and how is it that having black women in these spaces actually Actually, how does that, you know, reflect on voters? How does that kind of encourage us in any way? Ashley, I want to thank you so much for this. I look forward to all of the work that you have coming up this month. But of course, the conversation that should continue well beyond February. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chan. The agenda this week examined the gender pay gap among physicians in Ontario, learned what role internationally educated nurses could play in our healthcare system, and looked into whether COVID-19 was leading to a baby bust in Canada. The Agenda's Week in Review begins by finding out the latest on what's called Long COVID. In the year since you were last with us, what do you know now about long haulers, as they're called, that you didn't know a year ago? We are learning a lot um, in terms of uh, what is causing these long haul symptoms. 
Uh, we have some top hypotheses uh, for why people are having these symptoms. Um, probably the top one is vascular endothelial dysfunction, uh, which means there's a damage to the lining of the blood vessels and it affects how um, blood is delivered to various systems. And uh, the second hypothesis is um, uh, immune dysregulation. So there's a uh, change in the way that our immune system is working, and it may not be behaving the, in the usual way. And then the last um, hypothesis is really uh, around uh, residual viral particles um, or residual virus hiding. And um, those uh, three are the top hypotheses right now. Okay. And there are studies supporting all of these um, uh, uh, hypotheses. And let me get you to follow up on that in, in this regard. Of the total universe of people that get COVID-19 at all, what percentage of them are long haulers? You know, it's very difficult to estimate, but I think it's between 10 and 50 percent. So the lower estimate is 10 percent, which means, um, you know, like in Canada, we have more than 3 million people uh, who have had COVID. And so uh, 10 percent would be 300,000 people. Um, and it may be as high as um, it, it may be as high as even close to a million. Um, the problem is the definition of long COVID. Uh, do you count people who only have one symptom, like loss of smell and taste, and they're not quite back to normal? Or do you only count those who can't go to work and still have debilitating symptoms and can't do the activities of daily living? Mm -hmm. And so I think, um, you know, it's the severity of it that, um, that makes a difference in terms of the percentage. And Dr. Banerjee, let me try this with you. Just as with regular COVID-19, if you're a young person, a teenager, uh, the, the impact of getting COVID-19 is likely to be a lot less than if you're an older person. Is it the same with long COVID? So we don't really know uh, how many kids have had uh, COVID to begin with. So we don't have a denominator because kids with mild symptoms don't, don't get screened. And sometimes the test can be falsely negative. And so, and again, we have different definitions of what is long COVID. But if you look at uh, the studies, it, again, it's between 2 and 50% of kids that have a positive test for COVID that end up having long symptoms. So, so there's a, you know, we think in general, most kids don't get too sick, but there's a small percentage of kids that have debilitating ongoing symptoms. And I'll follow up with you with this. Would the symptoms, if you're a younger person and you're a long hauler, be the same as if you're an adult? Um, I think that there are less um, kids that have symptoms, but the symptoms are similar with the, the brain fog, the muscle ache, the shortness of breath, but also it depends on, like for adults, they have more comorbidities. They have higher rates of diabetes and things like that. So there may be more impact, but I've seen uh, children, more teenagers than younger kids that have quite debilitating symptoms, similar to adults. Dr. Chelios, what's the longest amount of time you've heard of somebody living with long COVID? I, I've seen patients actually with symptoms persisting more than 15 to, to 16 months. I, I don't know about two years, most likely. We had the first uh, cases in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, in February uh, 2020. So I guess we, we need some time for this. But what I'm seeing, Mr. Bacon, in general, because I'm taking care of patients with uh, long COVID here at, in Hamilton and at the uh, St. Joseph's Hospital, is that some of the symptoms may uh, may get better with time. For example, fatigue or in this difficulty breathing, some of them feel better with time. In some symptoms, like the anxiety, the depression, the, uh, the, the non-restorative sleep these people experience is not getting better, at least after six months uh, from, from, from the start of their follow-up. So we, we see that this, this is an issue to these people, and this creates not only anxiety, but disability. But uh, the disability when it comes to work, some of these patients are still on short-term disability, and I'm afraid that we'll need to, uh, to consider this in the future. 
women and men have been graduating from medical school at about the same rate for two decades. There are going to be more women doctors in this country than men by the end of this decade. And yet women are, are really far behind in, in terms of the, of the leadership pipeline. Well, we have one of them here, and I'd like to know what she thinks uh, at the beginning of what you hope, I presume, will be a long career in the medical field. What do you think, Dr. Dosa, when you see these numbers? Yeah, I mean, I think it reflects the lived experience that I see as I go through my medical training. You know, often we hear the argument that this is just a pipeline issue and things will get better over time. Um, but if we reflect on the specialties that are already predominantly women, we see that that's not actually what's happening. I think if we look at obstetrics and gynecology, it's a great example of that. Predominantly women, uh, women are in the majority and have been for a very long time. But even within that specialty, if you look at who's occupying the leadership positions throughout the country, it's still heavily, heavily dominated by men. So I don't think it's necessarily a pipeline issue. I don't think that we can just assume that things are going to get better on their own over time. Well, let me make this assumption. My assumption is that the people watching or listening to this suspect that you and your male counterparts earn the same. Do you? Uh, I'd love to say that women in medicine and in surgery, which is what I practice, make the same amount as their male counterparts. Unfortunately, we have evidence that that's not the case. Uh, we've studied that specific question here in Ontario, where physicians are primarily paid on a fee-for-service basis, meaning you get paid for the procedures that you do in surgery. And it sounds like, in theory, it should be an equitable system. And unfortunately, we've shown here in Ontario, female surgeons make about 25% less than their male counterparts. Now, how is that possible? If you're both paid the same amount for the same service, how can you be making so much less? Yeah, I, obviously, if we're doing the same service, we get paid the same amount. Uh, so really, the mechanism behind this is the idea that we're not doing the same service, that for whatever reason, women are more often doing the less lucrative procedures in surgery and probably practicing that way throughout medicine, not just in surgery. Um, our data show that the more remunerative a procedure becomes, the fewer and fewer women you see doing that procedure. And I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think women are choosing to do the procedures that make or provide less uh, income. Uh, we have to believe that there is some kind of systemic bias that's driving this. Okay, here's our systemic bias expert now, Sarah Kaplan, who we bring into the conversation. Do we assume, Sarah Kaplan, that for whatever reason, uh, the province of Ontario and or the Ontario Medical Association, which after all negotiates these fees, do we assume that they are putting a greater importance on the procedures mostly done by men as opposed to by women? Is that what's happening? I think that's a really interesting hypothesis and one that it, it could be true that because of the historical leadership gap that Robin already pointed out, that the people who are in power who are negotiating these rates are negotiating rates for the procedures that, th that they do. I think the other reason, though, really has to do much more with referrals. So, for example, in surgery, surgeons don't do procedures without being referred uh, a patient from a, another doctor. And often those referrals are biased. There's plenty of research to show that, in fact, women are getting referrals for the lower uh, remunerating procedures than men are. And so that accumulates over time because if you're not getting the referral to do the, the procedure that pays more, you're not going to be able to do that procedure. Dr. Dosa, I presume you are a member of the Ontario Medical Association now. Do you think they know yeah. about this issue that we've just identified? Yes, I think they do. I think they've published their own research corroborating all of this, uh, showing that there is a gender pay gap across all medical specialties in the province. Um, and I think they do now know that some of this is rooted in referral bias. Uh, we recently did a study, our group here, uh, showing that that was certainly driving a fair amount of the gender pay gap. So the data are out there, and now it's just a matter of trying to address them and find solutions to this issue. Well, that's the question, isn't it? Do you think they're adequately seized of this issue to want to do something about it? Yes, I think, in fact, the time is now. Um, I think that all the data are out there. Uh, if there is going to be change, this is the time. And I actually think that the pandemic... Uh, opens up a window of opportunity. We've seen through the pandemic a number of ways in which our healthcare system has deficiencies. Uh, and it really gives us the opportunity to try and address numerous issues. 
uh, those being to provide better, more timely and equitable care for patients, but also how to restructure our healthcare system to make sure physicians are treated equitably as well. Sarah, let's hit on one really quite fascinating finding here, which is that health outcomes and success rates of procedures, the system measures this stuff and they measure it when these procedures are done by male as opposed to female surgeons and or doctors. What have we learned about the outcomes depending on gender? The research has shown that when uh, women uh, are, have uh, an operation from a surgeon who is male, they are 15% more likely to have negative outcomes and 32% more likely to die than if their surgeon is a woman. And that difference doesn't exist for male patients. So there's no difference between a female and a male surgeon for a male patient. So this is the kind of evidence that's suggesting that, you know, these biases, the lack of access to these uh, professions is creating real health inequities. Let me ask every Canadian nurse out there how they will feel if they were to go to another country and be told that the only way they can tr transition to practice is to work um, in another area, like for example, as a personal support worker, how would it feel for you? And to bring your your credential, your Canadian credential, which you think you believe right now is so valuable and so you know highly esteemed and 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 then they tell you that it's not enough because we have a process yes we have standards we have to meet those standards high quality care and education however i think a lot of this a lot of this has to do with um discrimination uh amina i see your head uh you're nodding a lot uh so i can uh, assume that you are agreeing with uh Virgit a lot on this i'm curious obviously uh, you and Carla have first-hand experience. What are some of the barriers faced by uh, internationally educated nurses when they get here? I think, first of all, is the lack of clarity in the process. Uh, once you send your credentials to be evaluated and you receive the report and send that to CNO, uh, the response you receive, they are not clear how to address those gaps. So, for example, in my case, my biggest gap was the education I won because my education was not evaluated equivalent to the Canadian one. And now, how do I do to fill those gaps? So, they're not really clear orientations. They say it is your responsibility to find the program. And after you complete the program, they're going to evaluate if that is enough or not. So, then I need to go there, find the program myself complete the program, pay for that. So just after that, I can receive a response if that would be uh, equivalent or not. And also another thing that I also think it is huge, it is the delays in the process. So as I said, I send different types of documentations to CNO to try to somehow address those gaps. And they had some response that took over a year to receive back. And then you receive those response and they did not accept that. So now we need to start everything uh, from the stretch again. So I think it should be more clarity in the process for sure. Carla, I want to get you in on this. Uh, it seems like you've done your due diligence. You've gone back, you've done all your tests, you've done everything. What are your thoughts in terms of the barriers there um, You know, for someone who's still waiting? Well, the barriers, first and foremost, is it's very costly. For caregivers, there are 300 internationally educated nurses who are working as caregivers. So for them, some of them are helping out their families. So the, the salary that they receive should be divided between sending money to their families and also with the registration. So it's quite hard for them because every examination is expensive. You have to take the NCLEX, you have to take the IELTS, the documentations, you have to call your school for them to submit all the documentations needed by the assessment, the assessment, the people assessing with the College of Nurses of Ontario. It, it's quite hard. Another is that, um, like I said, it's you are working full time you some of them are even working very long hours they do not have enough time to study so it's quite hard for for people like me to balance the time between studying between working on the documentation between between working as a caregiver i want to 
pull up a tweet uh, that Birgit once tweeted. You know who isn't done with COVID? Nurses. We are tired of people who don't care about how their actions affect the vulnerable, immune compromised, disabled, and marginalized amongst us. We are tired of being called heroes. We are so tired of everyone who's done with COVID. Hero. It's a, a bit of a, a triggering word. Why? Why do we have to call, be called heroes? If not that they've made the working conditions so bad and they're shocked that we're able to thrive despite the poor working conditions. Um, and not only that, like the same government that calls us heroes has put in a legislation to cap our wages. Like what a slap in the face. Like with the one hand you say, hey, heroes. And with the other hand, well, you can bargain your pay. No matter the increase in workload, I do not care. You know what? I'm going to keep providing you hospital beds. I'm going to keep, you know, um, trying to find you, um, you know, non-qualified, non-nursing staff to come and assist you despite being short. Um, so, yes, uh, every time I hear that word heroes, I am triggered. And not just me, my colleagues are too, because the working conditions are so bad, I can't even tell you. Is it possible we could have a baby boom when COVID finally becomes endemic? Well, there might be a little boonlet, but I think the long-term trend is in the other direction. Um, I know that StatsCan has decided that we are among the lowest of the low in terms of fertility countries. No, they ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, South Korea has dropped below one. Uh, countries like Japan and Taiwan and Singapore, they are all crashing down to one or below one uh, or very close to one, a one full baby short of replacement rate. Um, and they are going to lose substantial portions of their population over the course of this century. China will lose up to half of its population over the course of this century. The same phenomenon is underway in parts of Eastern Europe as well. It is reasonable to assume that Canada will mimic everyone else and that our population will continue, uh, our total fertility rate will continue to decline to somewhere around one. No one yet has actually seen what the absolute bottom of, of this trajectory is. Laura, how about this? Um, and I don't want to indulge in too many stereotypes here, but I will just for argument's sake a little bit. You know what they say about this generation of childbearing people, right? That um, they're all extremely individual and, um, you know, <laughs> just very, very interested in what utterly unique people they are in the world. Has that kind of sense of individuality contributed to the fact that uh, they don't want to have as many kids as their parents or grandparents? Oh, I, I think that's a that's a big question. That's a loaded question. I think um, <laughs> sort of this we've seen this historical trend towards you know lower fertility. We call it like the demographic transition that is argued to be partly driven by this like push towards individualization, individual happiness, the the, the pursuit of, of of your freedoms and 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 what makes you happy versus sort of like those traditional ideas about you know supporting your family and sort of these responsibilities, these these you know religious or or familial responsibilities. So I don't think it's any specific generation that is, you know, particularly individualistic. I think the the bigger issues are sort of the structural constraints that the 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 childbearing population is dealing with right now. It's the unaffordable housing, it's um you know, economic uncertainty, uh, you know, job losses, stagnant wages, inflation. It's its that, you know, children um, cost money, <laughs> cost a lot of money. Um, and that, um, you know, it really does take a village to to raise children. Um, and I think sort of the, the other implications of this aging population is that, um, you know, you used to think about a family tree and you had like all of these, these branches coming off of your tree, but with fewer and fewer um, babies born per generation, our, our babies are, our families are looking much more like a bean pole. So we have many generations alive at, this, at, at a time, but few people within each of those generations, which means these sorts of, you know, family support systems, family care systems, grandparents taking care of grandkids or adult children taking care of their aging parents there's there's fewer people to draw on mm. um so i don't think it's about 
selfishness about you know um, self fulfilling and, and and some sort of you know pursuit of of happiness in a hedonistic sense. I, I think it's trying to balance all of these really competing, um, challenging structural systems um, that make having having babies and having large families really difficult. Gotcha. Well, I did say I was indulging in stereotyping there just for effect. <laughs> but anyway, uh, down to our last couple of minutes here. And Tally, let me ask you about this. Most people I talk to who have children say it's the greatest thing they've ever done in their lives. It has brought such joy and, and yes, of course, heartbreak and difficulties and all that. But at the end of the day, it's the most meaningful thing they will ever do. Are you really telling us that there are patients of yours that, that say, you know, the price of housing is too big these days and therefore I'm going to forego that profound experience? Really? Well, you know, what I'm hearing more is, in my practice at least, um, my patients who have had a child or two and maybe thought they would have three or maybe even four after experiencing the hardship of the last two years are saying to themselves, you know, I think we're good. Um, it's been really tough and their ideals and values have shifted. Um, and I think it's just really important to remember that Canada, and I just want to mention this, you know, similar to other Western countries, um, women develop their professional and educational paths often before entering motherhood and childbearing is postponed. And so the more it's postponed and, you know, this pandemic, which has just heightened so many of the challenges we have in terms of, um, you know, children and childbearing, um, it might have just postponed things a little bit more for people. And so either people have changed their values, they've changed their ideals, they've had a really difficult time in terms of disruption of their entire social networks um, and are saying, you know what, I'm, I might not have that additional child right now and that's okay for me. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find the full conversations on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, February 4th, 2022. Monday, a tour of some significant sites in Ontario for Black History Month. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.